in diamond light source to a new level of brilliance. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. It's great. Uh, I just sorry. Oh, I've got the, the switchy thing, don't I? Yeah. Yeah, that thing there. It's it's a it's a pleasure on all sorts of levels to be here. This is the first time I've oh, Mike. Yeah, I'm going to get mic'd up um, before I start wandering about. Um, this is the first time in two and a half years I've stood up in front of a number of real people and actually spoken. It's the first time for almost three years I've actually spoken about Diamond um, to anything like an audience. So I've had to go back and sort of uh, remind myself of all the things that we've done over the last three years. My brief was, um, and it's also, it's a great pleasure to see quite a lot of very familiar faces and uh, former, I was going to say former friends and colleagues, former colleagues and friends in, in the audience. So uh, great to see all sorts of people out there. My brief, you know, as the name suggests, it's, it's, a, it's a public lecture actually was to imagine there's an audience, not just of um, chemists out there, but actually the general public. So quite a lot of what I'm going to say is fairly general, um, but I will also add some things towards the end about where Future Development and Diamond might actually specifically serve the community of, of chemists and, and biologists. I'm not sure if you're a biologist or a chemist, Nick, um, but anyway, people who's, who's, who are involved in catalysis. Um, it doesn't work. Oh, there. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the origins of Diamond. In some ways, building Diamond here was synchrotrons coming back to this site. The story of synchrotrons on this site actually started in the 1950s. The biggest um, facility ever built on UK soil was Nimrod, the proton synchrotron in the 1950s. And building that here in a funny sort of way, and I'll show you how, led to Diamond coming back here via Darsbury. I'm going to tell you something about what Diamond does today, actually quite across quite a broad spectrum, as I say, um, noting that there's perhaps a, a wider public out there. Um, and then I'm going to tell you something about where we hope to go to in the future. And some of you might have seen the announcement actually last week that we're in that portfolio of infrastructure funding, uh, which means we've got our preliminary funding to actually start um, the upgrade um, as soon as we get all the official nods. So that is something that we actually should start for real next year. But the origins, ooh, now, I, I do it by, do it on the screen. Right, okay, I'll get there eventually. Oh, the other way. <laughs> I told you I haven't done this for a while. <laughs> so the origins of synchrotron such as diamond actually lie in, in high energy physics. And of course, you know, uh, almost 100 years ago, what people in that domain wanted to do is accelerate charged particles to higher and higher energies, collide them with targets and with each other to smash open first of all the nucleus and then look even deeper into, into how matter is, is, is composed. So those accelerators started in relatively crude linear accelerators. Here we've got Cockroft sitting under what looks like his desk in the Cavendish in the 30s. Um, they started to scale up a bit with the development of the so-called cyclotron. And here we have Ernest Lawrence. And here the principle was to um, introduce, uh, in this case, electrons between these very large, powerful pole pieces of, of a magnet uh, and apply an alternating electric field. So the, the electron would be accelerated in, between the poles of magnets and describe this ever-increasing spiral as it got to higher and higher energies. But that was limited by how big you could build permanent or large, um, uh, large cylindrical magnets like that. So the next step, was actually the synchrotron itself, was to put, um, to replace the large uh, uh, bi dipolar magnets with an array of much, uh, uh, much uh, less powerful magnets uh, around an evacuated tube through which the electrons or the protons, whatever they could circulate. Each magnet, of course, causing the electrons or the, or the protons to deviate a little bit and describe a, a perfect arc. And then um, uh, as the electrons circulated, they would be given a synchronized pulse of electromagnetic radiation, just as if you, if you synchronize the, 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 um, the impetus you give to a, a, a playground um, a roundabout, you can get, get it to, to, to get up to quite a high speed. And the, the energy of those devices was limited again by the size of the ring you can build. So the race was on to build ever larger rings, synchrotrons, and as I said, the largest facility ever to be built on British soil was the Nimrod proton synchrotron in Hull in the 1950s. And at the time, there was, as we have now, sort of a leveling up agenda. If you're going to build something in the southeast, you should build something in the north. And that led to the, the, the complementary foundation um, of a facility called NINA. I actually, I actually tried to Google what NINA stood for this, this morning. It, it, it doesn't appear to be Googleable, but it's probably something like the, the Northern Institute for uh, Nuclear Accelerators. But anyway, that was founded as an electron synchrotron at Darsbury um, 
in, in the late 50s, early 60s. And I'll come back to Nina in a moment. Um, and of course, you know, the most famous synchrotron, arguably, um, nowadays is, is that of the Large Hadron Collider, 30 kilometers or so forth, reaching immense energies deep underground, uh, between, um, uh, under the ground in France and, and, and Switzerland. Now, the purpose of those machines was to accelerate particles to very high energies and collide them. Um, it happens that at the same time, they produce um, radiation. So by the laws of, uh, of, of uh, electromagnetism developed in the 19th century by people like James Clark Maxwell, um, there was a prediction that, and actually observation that charged particles describing a circular orbit would give out energy in the form of radiation. And as their speed increased, so that radiation would become brighter, would become more focused, and would become higher in energy until ultimately as it approached, as the particles approached the speed of light, um, it, would, it, would, <clears throat> uh, it would achieve a, a limit which was termed synchrotron radiation. That's actually something that happens naturally. So for example, in the depths of space, this is a picture of the Crab Nebula, where you have a soup of charged particles of all sorts and very intense electric and magnetic fields causing those particles to stream and change their direction very rapidly. You get this brilliant radiation, synchrotron radiation. Um, um, so that was something that was predicted, it was observed uh, astronomically, and then it was first observed on Earth actually almost exactly 75 years ago. So uh, March the 7th of this year was the 75th anniversary of the first observation of synchrotron uh, radiation on Earth. What, what I love about this incident is, I mean, have a look at this paper. You know, this is an entire paper. It's a landmark result, and you can, you can publish this all in a few hundred words um, uh, uh, with, with a handful of... Um, handful of, of, of references, and it sort of reminds me that in some ways, uh, I, I'm not sure we've entirely progressed uh, in science. Um, oh dear, I've done something terrible to the, uh, hang on, let me get back again. Um, anyway, so first observation of synchrotron radiation, but it was still largely regarded as a nuisance. You know, if you generate that in CERN, you, 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 know, you start to damage the, the, the machine itself, you have to shield um, people from it because it's harmful. It results in energy loss, so you have to keep putting energy into the synchrotron. Um, but in the 1960s, a couple of bright sparks at Manchester University started to think they might actually be able to do something useful with that radiation. It wasn't just a parasitic nuisance. Maybe they could do something. Uh, and they, they literally took a pipe and piped off, in this case, some of the bright ultraviolet radiation. So you see them standing here. I think they were in the physics rather than the chemistry departments in Manchester. And they started to do research with that radiation. And around them uh, grew a community so that by the late 70s, there were sufficient people and sufficient cause to put a place of government to build the first um, uh, purpose, first synchrotron built in the world with the, with the express purpose of generating brilliant radiation rather than accelerating particles. And that, of course, was the, the synchrotron radiation source which started uh, operations in Darsbury in 1981. And it was remarkable in, in, in at least two ways. Um, first of all, well, first of all, it was a world first in, as, a, as, a, as a dedicated synchrotron facility to produce light, but it was also one of the very first user facilities. Um, so rather than the research being primarily conducted by the people in the facility, it was there to provide service for, for the wider scientific community. It was also built specifically to generate, it was optimized to generate brilliant light as well. So rather than um, having uh, uh, that storage ring which it, through, around which the electrons circulate um, with, a, with a very large number of relatively uh, weak magnets, um, it was built as a series of straight sections. And I, I can get the, can I get the, um, I'm not sure I can get the light here. Um, have I got a pointer? The problem is that I'm red, I'm red, green, colorblind, and I can never. Um, well, I, I can. I'm sure you can see on the top right that that the, the the structure is a series of straight sections. At the end of each of which is a very powerful dipolar magnet, which causes the electron beam to uh, rapidly change direction and give out a brilliant flash of light. So the construction was uh, was such as to optimize the light that was produced, and that was the first so-called second generation source. The next step was to introduce in those straight sections uh, a, a, an additional type of device that was even more effective at converting the, um, the electron beam uh, to light. And these were so-called insertion devices. And you can see on the bottom left that they essentially, they're essentially composed of an array of powerful magnets of alternating polarity. So as the electron beam goes through them, 
um, it will oscillate from side to side and describe a wave like motion. And each time it changes direction, it gives out light. And if you get the spacing um, of the magnets and such, that light then uh, adds up constructively. So you get an even brighter beam at the end of it and a certain degree of coherence. So these insertion devices, so called undulators and wigglers, marked. Um, the third generation sources of which the ESRF and Grenoble was the first example. And if you look at the progress from what were conventional X-ray sources before synchrotrons were used through to second to third sources, we see an absolutely astonishing you know, 10 to 12 orders of magnitude increase in brightness over that time. And you'll notice at the top, and I'll come back to this later, um, we've got a space for a so-called fourth generation source. Now, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about what that means uh, and what the consequences are. So as, as I'm sure everyone in here knows, but not necessarily everybody knows, that brilliant light is then directed into a series of instruments that we call beam lines. And we, we conduct a variety of, of, of measurements around them. And essentially there are, um, and, and that the, the, the light that we generate, as I've said, has remarkable um, properties. Not only is it brilliant, but we can tune its energy. We use mostly X-ray uh, light in the form of X-rays, um, but we can also generate brilliant infrared um, and uh, an ultraviolet light. We can focus that down into spots which are just tens of nanometers. And the light that we produce is highly coherent. That is that the, 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 the individual uh, photons are largely in phase with one another. And we'll see that it has consequences for the way that we can do, uh, we can do, we can do measurements. And crudely speaking, there are, there are three sorts of ways that we, um, we use the, the radiation. So imagine the light coming into a sample from the left. Um, some of that light will be, will be, will be scattered, and we'll see that, the, that that scattering process is the basis of diffraction, but I'll also touch on the, the inelastic scattering. So some of the light is scattered without any change in energy. Um, some of that light um, excites the electrons in the atoms, and as they relax, they give out radiation. They can also give out electrons, uh, and some of that light is absorbed in that fashion, so those absorption processes. And those absorption processes and scattering processes take intensity out of the through beam. So we see an overall attenuation. And that gives us the basis for um, diffraction measurements, which tell us about the structure of materials down to atomic uh, detail. Uh, it allows us to perform uh, uh, X-ray imaging. Uh, and it also enables us, and this is something very familiar to the chemists among you, it also allows us to perform spectroscopy and, among other things, determine exactly where the atoms, not in the chemical speciation, of those atoms are in a, in a sample down to, um, down to very fine resolution. So I'm going to start with imaging, um, partly because this was the first application of x-rays, but also it's the, the technique that is probably most familiar uh, to everybody in hospital scanners and, and, and uh, 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 airport security devices. Um, so the discovery, discovery of x-rays, Röntgen um, first applied them to look at, in fact, the, the sample he used was his wife's hand. Um, exploiting the difference of the absorption of X-rays um, between the heavy metal in the in the wedding ring and the much average uh, lighter elements in the soft tissue and the bones in the hand, and you'll notice among other things that whilst it picks out the ring and the bones quite well, um, it's very poor at re re uh, uh, um, uh, presenting any detail in in the soft tissue. Um, and it's not known exactly what Anna Ronchin thought of this, but she was trotted around the salons of Europe to demonstrate her husband's discovery for decades um, after this. And actually, was apparently to a lot of the, the, the people at the time, it's a rather disturbing uh, experience to sort of see reveal the bones within, within people. Now, that, that relies on the differential absorption, the reduction in the amplitude um, of the wave as it passes through uh, a very heavy um, uh, element as opposed to light materials. If you use light that has a high degree of coherence, um, you can also differentiate between different regions of the sample because there may be a phase shift between the X-rays as they pass through one region of the sample and another. So using synchrotron X-rays not only allows you to, to perform measurements much more quickly in the finer detail because the X-rays are much brighter, but you can also um, uh, 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 resolve differences in, uh, between materials that might have rather similar uh, X-ray absorption properties. And of course, with that extra brightness, you can measure things much more quickly. And you can build up 3D images of materials, essentially by taking a series of slices as you rotate the sample in the beam and construct a 3D image from these slices. And that process is known as tomography, from the Greek tomos um, for, for slice. So put all those together. And the comparison between the Rontgen 
experiment, the rather simple experiment, and not, not quite today, but just as a sort of a, a, an illustration, this is the eye of a bee, um, clearly made a, out of uh, material which is relatively homogeneous or uh, on average is very similar in terms of its, its average uh, um, uh, 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 elemental mass. And you can see that you can pull out very fine detail in three dimensions uh, and look at contrast between um, objects which are not simply the contrast between a heavy metal and soft tissue. And just to give you some actual examples of research um, uh, uh, done relatively recently at Diamond. So we took delivery of this exquisite um, fossil, 3.7 million year old fossil of the hominid skull, better known as Littlefoot, um, and, and performed um, tomography experiments on that. So illustratively illustrated here, reconstructed um, the, the, the skull in three dimensions down to the level of detail, of spatial detail, very much below the, the, the scale of uh, blood vessels in the bone. So among other things, what that allowed the paleontologists to do is to get insights into development, the evolutionary development of bones, a skull from, from this creature to the present day, um, and also got insights into um, the, the eating habits and the stress uh, on, on this creature through looking at the structure and the, the texture of, of, of the teeth. Um, staying with evolution, but also illustrating another point that whilst a lot of the, 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 the development at Diamond has been around the source and the beam lines, equally important, and this is really where uh, interactions with organizations like the, the Catalysis Hub is, 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 is critical, is also the way in which we present, um, prepare samples and present them to, to the beam. So an awful lot of the development of diamond has been around sample environment and automation. And this is an example of robotics, which takes what used to be a real chore, repetitively putting samples in the beam, whether it's crystallography, or in this case, in imaging, um, used to be an extremely, you know, those, those of us who do our PhDs, um, spending a lot of time at synchrotrons, remember many sleepless nights and often mistake, mistakes made. Well, um, increasingly, that kind of repetitive activity is done much more precisely um, with much less stress uh, by robots and other automated devices. And the particular application here um, is, to, is to digitize uh, phenotype information from a vast collection, in this case, of beetles held in the, in the National History Museum. The project here being to look at the evolution of phenotypes. It could be the carapace structure. It could be the, the nature of the, of the limbs, uh, whatever it is. But the first step, is to digitize hundreds and thousands um, of, uh, of, of these specimens and then to look for evolutionary uh, development. What is, it, what is it that changes from uh, over time in a species of bee, beetle or across species? Um, uh, and a, an ongoing project which is, uh, which is starting to, 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 to produce really interesting insights into, into this, this area of, of, of evolution. Um, uh, we can also use imaging to look at engineering and processing problems. The, the highly penetrating power of the beam can, can look deep into, into, into dense metals. So this, for example, is a real-time image um, uh, with, a, with a resolution of milliseconds looking inside a weld. So you see on the top right um, the, the real-time image, as, as, if you like, of the, of the liquid droplet, the, the metal droplet. In that has been inserted some flakes of tungsten a heavier metal which provides a contrast, and then there's a time-lapse photograph at the bottom right which, which sort of tracks the, um, the turbulence in the liquid, giving insights into the relationship between the processing conditions and, the, uh, and, the, and ultimately the, the, um, uh, the success of, of the weld. And then coming back finally to soft tissue, um, one of the latest beam lines to come on is a full field um, X-ray microscope, which can work down to what's called the around the water window. Here's an example um, uh, of uh, a tomogram of uh, uh, a bone cell, uh, which is which is cancerous. Um, so osteosarcoma cells. Um, a series of images taken of the cell as it's tilted through a number of degrees, and then from that can be reconstructed the whole cell um, whole cell image. And so this is something that could be done with a much higher resolution than, say, an optical microscope. 
um, but the x-rays are much more penetrating than electron microscopy. So it, it, it provides insights that you could not um, provide um, by, by either of those two techniques. But something I'll come back to is the increasing prevalence of bringing together x-ray and, and microscopy techniques. Okay, so moving on from, um, uh, from imaging to scattering now, starting historically, so it was von Laue who first showed that or postulated that if x-rays have a wave-like quality, they should be scattered by the atoms in the crystal to give patterns um, which are, which are uh, a, a consequence of the particular crystalline array. Um, so he, he first of all demonstrated that diffraction could occur. It took the Braggs, father and son, to relate the diffraction pattern to the structure. Um, and that really was the start of, of, of the, the field that we know of crystallography. Um, starting with the very simplest structures. There's some lovely um, exchanges in the literature around about the time that um, the Braggs uh, presented the structure of sodium chloride because one of the theories at the time was that within sodium chloride, there should actually be little sodium and chlorine dimers within the structure and then spacings between the dimers. And, uh, and when, 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 when the Braggs revealed that actually the atoms or the ions were equally spaced, there was a certain degree of outrage actually in the, in the literature. This somehow confounded the, uh, an awful lot of the received wisdom of the day. But it, you know, ultimately, the experimental technique couldn't be um, argued with. Scroll forward 40 years, you have the pioneering work of Rosalind Franklin, um, who uh, was, was among the leaders in being able to actually um, uh, develop and apply x-ray techniques. Now, the, 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 and of course, you know, the famous photograph 51 and others um, ultimately provided the, the, the clues to the structure of um, uh, DNA. It would have taken um, Franklin one to five days to take photographs like that. Photograph 51 was a 24 hour exposure. Um, you can see its reproduction incidentally on the side of the, of, uh, of the Rodman Franklin Institute just across here. Um, you for, fast forward um, another 40 years ago or so, you, you, you end up with the Nobel Prize winning work on the ribosome of Ada Yonath, um, Venki Ramakrishnan and uh, Tom Stites. And of course, they were able to use yet brighter sources with much more effect, efficient detectors to look at far more complicated structures. Nowadays on diamond, and indeed most synchrotrons, you can do, you can, you can determine the structure of uh, materials like this, far more complex than DNA, um, take the measurement and determine the structure, do the first round of, of, of structure data refinement in about three minutes. Um, and if you think back, you know, at the time it took literally years for, uh, for the structure of DNA to be determined from the, uh, from, 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 the, 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 from the data. That whole process of measurement, well, putting the sample in the beam, measurement, data analysis, repeat, uh, is all done in a matter of, of minutes. And again, the key thing there is not just the brightness of the source, um, the precision of the instruments, it's also all of the, 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 the um, challenges around uh, uh, getting the sample in the beam in a reliable way. Um, I think you've all seen diffraction before. So to give, give you a couple of examples, uh, recent um, uh, diffraction work out of diamond, um, actually touching now on biocatalysis. Um, so this, is, this, is, this story started in, in Japan where it was discovered that there was a form of bacterium that thrived on landfill sites. And it's, um, it had adapted to digesting PET, breaking down the polymer, into the constituent molecules as a, as a, as a source of food and, and energy. Um, of course, the crystal structure and exactly how that, um, uh, uh, how the enzyme, the chemical catalyst work was done, by, was determined by crystallography. But the next step was the really clever one. And this was a group um, led by uh, John McGeehan at Portsmouth University. And that was to genetically modify um, uh, the material so that it would do its chemistry at a much higher chemistry temperature. So introducing um, uh, elements of thermophiles to, uh, to, to um, produce a, a new enzyme that could be used at a much higher temperature. And of course, that then opens the door to industrialization of this as a plastic uh, remediation process. And that work has gone forward in, 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 in leaps and bounds since then, is on the verge of actual practical industrialization. Um, the other area that has been a real growth area or an area that's been a real growth area for diamond, and actually the first for us, has been um, the, the development of so-called fragment screening for, for drug discovery. And here, the principle is that 
if, if you want to get insights into the potential of small molecules to bind at particular sites um, on, on, a, on a biological target, um, uh, one of the things you can do is to take the tar crystals of the target molecule and soak it in libraries of um, these potential smaller molecules. So the, the process starts on the left, the growth of uh, a collection of crystals. They're then soaked in these libraries of potential uh, target uh, molecules. Uh, and then individually, those crystals, each of which have been co-crystallized with, um, with, with, with each member of the library, has its crystal structure determined. Now, in order to do that efficiently, you need to be able to measure hundreds of these crystal um, ligand combinations a day and that sort of process is exactly what has been set up here. So on the right you see a sort of a typical outcome for part of this biological target molecule where the crystallographic data tells you where the individual members of the library have bound and that gives you insights into the potential of these small molecules to act as anchors and ultimately uh, as, as part of larger molecules as potential drugs to, 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 treat, um, to treat disease. Um, I, I always wind up my organic or my sorry my biological colleagues by saying that not all crystal structures, of course, are, are bio, are, 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 uh, of biological interest. Of course, there's a massive interest in in inorganic uh, materials discovery, and I think this is a particularly and of course again at Diamond that crystallography can also be brought to bear uh, on high throughput structure determination in in an inorganic materials context. Uh, and this I think is a particularly nice example because it brings together artificial intelligence methods. Um, led out of Liverpool with Matt Rosinski uh, and Andy Cooper, artificial intelligence methods to direct the search in vastly complex multidimensional chemical space as to where one might focus one's attention if you want to um, develop a material with a particular structure or even, even function. And of course, the complementary thing here is once you've come up with with a library of, of output compounds is you have to rapidly determine their structure, some of which are often very complex. And this, is, this also brings together both neutron um, and X-ray techniques to then characterize um, the, 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 the candidate uh, materials to actually determine their structure and, 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 and point to which of them might also have uh, promising uh, physical characteristics, in this case, looking at potential new um, uh, battery materials. Um, just as an aside, I, I mentioned much earlier on that the scattering process provides the basis for diffraction. And I skipped over the fact that the scattering of x-rays, though mostly elastic, could also, to some extent, be inelastic. That is to say, the x-rays might absorb or give up a little bit of their energy to the solid, either to excite things like vibrations in the solid or to receive energy from the vibrations in the solid. So in principle, one ought to be able to scatter electro, sorry, sorry, scatter X-rays off solids, and uh, and gain insights into things like vibrations by measuring small changes in energy. Um, now, if you look at the textbooks and you think about the scale of the the the, the quantities involved, you know, X-rays um, have energies which are often ten to hundred thousand times higher than the energies of vibrations in materials. And there's a, there's a lovely quote from a textbook in the 60s from William Cochrane, who was like the authority on, uh, on, on, on vibrations in solids, phonon physics. And he basically said, you'll never be able to use x-rays to look at vibrations in solids because the energy scales are too, too different. You'd have to be able to resolve you know, one part in, in 10 to 100,000. So what you'd want to do if you were to try to resolve tiny changes in energy is to build a spectrometer with an incredible resolving power. So to sort of give it a cartoonish um, um, uh, character, um, imagine the, the, the range of electrons, sorry, X-ray energy scattered by the solid is demonstrated by, by a part of the optical spectrum. Of course, it isn't in the same energy scale, but it's just to illustrate it. If you wanted to resolve very small differences in the spectrum, what you'd want to do is to put your detector as far away as possible and have very small pixel sizes uh, and also for the whole thing to be incredibly stable and that's exactly what um, was able to be done through really clever precise engineering pioneered I have to say at the ESRF but then uh, that design was was built upon um, here at, at Diamond so by putting a detector almost 20 meters away with very fine uh, fi fi fine resolution on the detector and making sure it's really stable so all of this is a very um, carefully 
thermally contained environment, one can now resolve at least one part in 50,000. And by, by way of illustration, that there's a, there's a really nice piece of uh, materials chemistry out of Peter Bruce's group in, in Oxford here. And what they were looking at was a, a cathode, a, an oxide material in a cathode, which loses its efficiency greatly after the first charge discharge cycle. So what happens in the first charge discharge cycle of this particular oxide? Well, what the inelastic, and to be technical about it, the resonant inelastic X-ray scattering measurement uh, enabled them to do was to detect the creation of molecular oxygen in the pores in the oxide on that first charge discharge cycle. So the structure breaks down a little bit, some of the oxide is transformed into the method for oxygen, and that's exactly what you can pick out through detecting the vibrational spectrum of oxygen um, in, in, that, in that first cycle in, in the material. So looking at chemical signatures deep inside materials, this wasn't actually an in-situ measurement, but in one future, one could imagine that it could be uh, also become an in-situ measurement. And then finally, on, on scattering, I just want to tell you one or two things, or back to diffraction now, um, about Diamond's involvement in, in COVID-19 research over the, the last two and a half years. And, you know, you cast your mind back. Um, I, I was sort of becoming vaguely aware that COVID-19 was a thing in January of 2020, by which time the structure had also already been determined by Chinese groups. Actually, I think it was published on the 20th of January um, 2020 using the Shanghai synchrotron. But the Shanghai synchrotron was due to go down for routine maintenance um, about a month and a half into, into the month. And we have particularly strong ties with the Chinese. Dave Stewart, my life sciences director, spent a year and a half in China in the late 70s and has maintained very strong connections. So the know-how to, um, to produce the protein, to produce the crystals was transferred uh, to diamond in, 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 in late, late January onwards. Uh, and groups here were able to work in the research complex, again, a huge asset to our research, um, to reproduce uh, those crystals and, of course, other crystals as the, as the, as the, the, the virus mutated and, and new variants were, were produced. Um, so the first high-resolution crystal structure, at that time the highest resolution crystal structure in the world, were done in February. And then that fragment screening process was one of many types of measurement that was brought to bear, for example, in the search of potential uh, ligands that could provide the basis for anchoring drugs and so forth. So, uh, so by, by, by um, um, early March, we were already assessing through fragment screening uh, potential agents to, to, to bind to specific sites. Most of the work at that point was focused on the protease, which is the key for viral replication. And I should say what was key was the fact that because we were already a highly automated um, organization, we could continue to perform most of those measurements with a very small group of people. So, of course, there had to be chemists, biologists actually preparing the samples, and we had to have people actually running the synchrotron. But we kept the whole thing going throughout COVID on probably about 20 people, um, ensuring the entire, at, at least for COVID-19 research, it was a bit longer before we sort of brought every, everyone back. Um, and I could give you many, many examples. So, you know, we, we, we were open, as many synchrotrons were, um, to the world. Um, but a particular piece of work which was focused around diamond scientists and people at Oxford and groups also uh, in Israel uh, was um, using that fragment screening process, but now interacting with computational chemists. So when the first fragment screening results came through, giving us clues as to which type of molecule might bind to which site, um, that information was then put out in the computational chemistry community, and they generated hundreds, thousands of potential other compounds that might then be screened. So there was a ma massive effort to then screen, to synthesize and screen all these other um, uh, potential um, potentially useful fragments, and that provided the basis then, in this particular case, uh, for a development program for um, uh, for safe, uh, oral safe antiviral treatments for, uh, for 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 the virus. And at the moment, actually, there's a particular um, lead um, candidate that's under development with hope to go to clinical trials by the end of uh, by the end of the of this year. Uh, and the key element here also is to make sure that whatever drugs we produce can be synthesized in a manner that's cheap and can be accessible to, to across the world to countries that are not necessarily able to afford more expensive drugs. I won't say very much more about COVID-19, 
Um, simply to say also that um, the work continues as variants emerge. Um, increasingly, we're using other techniques. So cryo-EM is a facility that we, we offer here. Um, and because we have this high throughput, highly automated setup, um, we've been extremely successful at determining structures of the variants and the variants in combination with all sorts of things bound, um, uh, bound to various parts of the, uh, of, of the virus. So 20% of all the structures in the world deposited in the protein data bank have come out of, have come out of diamond. So final illustration of COVID work um, done now in combination with other techniques. So uh, what we've also found is increasingly um, facilities have joined together across the campus. So work with the central laser facility on light um, microscopy um, with electron um, uh, microscopy imaging at, at EBIC now allows us to actually look at the, the development of the virus in cells. So on the left-hand side, you see at lower and then at bottom left, higher resolution um, uh, uh, microscopy. These are actually electron microscopy images of the, the, and you can actually recognize it, you can see the, 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 the characters of the virus with its spikes around it from the bottom left. So these are vitrified samples that are then microtomed, um, but they allow you to look at, as you, as you look at samples taken at various stages of infection, at the ingress, the evolution of the, uh, of the virus in the cells itself. And then finally, finally, um, some very recent work on the, the action of the, um, the AstraZeneca virus on, on, on in producing spike proteins in the cell. So the question was, what is the nature of the spike protein produced in the cell by the AstraZeneca virus? And the answer is, well, you can do it, actually. Uh, again, this, this, these are live cells that have been injected or uh, injected with the virus. The spike protein has, 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 has developed, and then the cells are frozen, and the image is taken. You can just see. Uh, pinpointed by those little triangles, the individual spike proteins, which can then be individually imaged and their structure shown to be uh, essentially the same as the spike protein in, in, in the virus itself. So final measurement, and I'll whip through this, spectroscopy um, historically um, uh, starts with Henry or Harry Mosley, pre-World War I, who observed that when you expose materials to, in this case, cathode rays, they could be induced to give out light in the form of X-rays, and those X-rays were characteristic of the individual elements. They give you a fingerprint of the elements, so to speak. That's the origin of fluorescence spectroscopy. Um, uh, if you uh, use brilliant synchrotron radiation as, as the means of exciting the, um, with very fine spatial resolution, exciting the sample, of course, you can now start to perform, as you know, element-specific um, uh, fluorescence spectroscopy. So on the left-hand side, very nice work from Joan Collingwood's group in, in, in Warwick, uh, looking at the, um, the elemental distribution uh, around um, features in, the, in, in normal and diseased brains. In this particular case, there's an inverse correlation between the presence of a particular element, and in this case, uh, an abnormality due to Parkinson's. And on the right-hand side, uh, again, one of many examples I could show of fluorescence microscopy, um, in this case, mapping out the way in which uh, metal from an artificial hip joint eventually could make its way into, into human tissue. And then what does one do to ensure that that doesn't occur? What coatings can one apply to uh, prosthetics and so forth? Uh, and how does one assess the, the, the efficacy of the, of the new material at stopping um, uh, um, uh, um, material entering uh, tissue? Closer to home though, and actually I think one of the areas where the Catalysis Hub has been particularly effective at developing um, methods, techniques, sample environment again, has been in the field of catalysis. And there's been an awful lot of really um, groundbreaking work done in, in collaboration between Diamond and groups that have come through the Catalysis Hub. So as many as you know, um, there, are, there are a variety of forms of spectroscopy. Um, uh, when you look in detail at the way in which X-rays are absorbed, um, by materials, um, uh, that tells you information about the presence of specific elements and also the chemical environment of those elements. In this case, Zane's spectroscopy um, performed um, uh, at the edges for molybdenum and platinum, revealing the distribution of uh, uh, molybdenum, platinum, co-catalyst. I think this is a hydrogenation 
a reaction of nitrogen containing hydrocarbons. But of course, as we know, uh, platinum in particular is an extremely rare um, and precious element. It's critical to know in the catalytic formulation how it's distributed in what form. So optimizing that is of, of great interest. And um, looking at these distribution with, with species specific probes uh, was one of the things that was pioneered between um, uh, diamond and people coming through the catalysis hub. And increasingly what we've seen is the bringing together of multiple techniques. Again, um, groundbreaking um, work here, looking um, at both the chemical speciation and the structure of elements of, of a catalytic, catalytic system. Now, um, groundbreaking, this is what you might call a heroic experiment in that it's extremely difficult to do it. The first experiment, uh, my, my understanding is that each slice um, uh, in, in the, each, each of these images took about 100 minutes to take. So Diamond, a few years ago, um, was, was still very much, so whilst it was groundbreaking, um, these were measurements that are far from um, being, 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 being effective in, in the sorts of timescales that might actually be interested in looking at transformations in real catalytic systems. But as I'll point out in a moment, this is something that we, we very much hope to change because um, as I said right at the outset, we are anticipating um, going, in, going into a, a, an extended program where we will overhaul the, the storage ring, the associated beamlines, and our uh, data and computation facilities. And that's because there has been um, a transformative development of the way in which uh, you can produce synchrotron radiation storage rings without going into all the technical details. Um, uh, there, there is a development in the technology that allows us to produce um, far uh, finer, um, what we call lower emittance beams. Um, it's already been uh, uh, it's already been enacted at um, the Max 4 synchrotron in Denmark uh, and the, the Sirius synchrotron in Brazil. And of course, there's been the, the ESRF upgrade. And now pretty much every leading synchrotron in the world is in the process of or is planning to um, upgrade its storage ring from third to fourth generation technology. What does that involve? Well, the thing that we're trying to, to, to optimize or minimize um, is, is, is the fineness of the beam. Um, the, the, the photograph that you see there is the, uh, the comparison between the larger um, pipe um, tube for the storage ring of the current diamond ring and what the, the, the future um, um, uh, pipe for the storage ring will be in diamond two. Um, and to generate these, these much finer beams, what you need to be able to do is to replace the, the powerful um, bending magnets, the dipolar magnets around the ring, by a larger number of less powerful magnets. So um, at the moment, Diamond has 24 of these sectors, each of which contains two powerful bending magnets. And the, 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 the general methodology is to replace seg sectors like that with sectors that have a larger number of less powerful dipole magnets, what are called multi-bend um, acromats. And the received wisdom is that you get the lowest emittance, you get this, this finest beam when you have an odd number of magnets in these um, MBAs. But the problem with that is um, by replacing powerful dipole magnets with less powerful ones, beam lines that used to be on powerful dipole magnets often find themselves in a much less advantageous situation. So there's a trade-off um, between much better emittance and, and the performance of the beam lines that used to be on bending magnets. And Diamond came up with a, with a, with a sort of a compromise here. Instead of going just for the ultimate emittance, um, and most of the upgrades of what are so-called 7BA um, storage rings, we've gone for uh, a design which has an even number of bending magnets in these sectors, what's called a 6BA um, uh, uh, design. And what that means, if you look at the top diagram, is that it allows you to insert a new straight section into this sector. And into that straight section, you can put a new insertion device. So everything that was on one of these bending magnets can now go on an insertion device. Uh, and it turns out that when you go through all of this for the, for the current diamond storage ring, that means that every single bending magnet beamline can go onto an insertion device, which generally means you get a much brighter light anyway. And we've even got spare capacity for a, for a, for a large number of additional um, beam lines. So what you get is 
is a much lower emittance, uh, which translates as essentially almost 100 times brighter. Um, uh, it allows you to increase the capacity. So our user community is growing all the time. So in some future, we wanted to add additional beam lines. We have the capacity. And then somewhat counterintuitively, and I'm going to go back, because if you look, if you remember the formula for the emittance, the emittance goes up, i.e. becomes less favorable as the energy goes up. So again, the received wisdom is on, on balance, you should be reducing the energy to optimize the emittance. And in fact, the highest energy um, synchrotrons in the world, spring eight, for example, eight, eight gigavolts, they're actually coming down in energy because they get to this lower in emittance, they need to come to, to lower energy. Now, again, I won't go into the details, but it was Laurent Chapon who spotted there's a really interesting trick to do with the, the way in which undulators work, such that actually, if you go higher in energy and you use the insertion device in a different way, you can actually, to a large extent, uh, compensate for the for the for the energy factor in the um, in the formula for the, for the emittance. So we also plan to go higher in energy as well. And the reason for that is, if you look at our user community, most of our user community use beam lines that run at higher energy. And um, so the graph on the right um, uh, shows the energy range of all of our beam lines. Those bars are the energy range of all our beam lines. They're mostly bunched around. 10 kilovolts, about, about one angstrom radiation. There are a number, and the number of very important ones that run at lower energy. Um, and then the red and the green lines show the gain factor you get from 3.5 gigavolts and 3 gigavolts, respectively, uh, compared to the, the current storage ring. And what you see, the red line is markedly, and this is a logarithmic scale, of course, markedly above the green line at the higher energy. So what the Diamond 2 will provide um, is far brighter light, particularly at high energy, so much more penetrating um, in, in a lot of circumstances, much better for in-situ work. Um, just to give you an idea of time scale, um, at the moment, the plan is to, is to convert from the old to the new ring from late 26 to early 28, so there will be a dark period of almost 18 months, um, as short as we can, we can manage it. Um, there's no getting around that. And one of the things we're doing is making sure that not all European facilities go down at a similar time. So we're trying to stagger that across Europe. Um, and then with the storage ring upgrade, of course, we, we, we also like to optimize the beam lines. Some new beam lines, which use new concepts, which are made feasible through, um, uh, through brighter, more coherent, um, harder x-rays. And I'll touch on two of them in a moment. But of course, every other, um, uh, 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 an awful lot of beam lines in their current state wouldn't necessarily be able to cope with with the brighter beams. So actually pretty much every beam line has to go through some level of upgrade to make sure, among other things, that its optics are up to, up to scratch. So there's a major overhaul of, of beam lines. And then of course, to complement that, there's no point generating, you know, um, uh, providing far brighter um, light and generating far more data on the detector if you don't have the compute power to handle all that extra data. Um, and just to give you an idea, some of the new beam lines coming through at um, at ESRF, um, uh, if you look at tomography experiments in particular, which require an awful lot of compute power to transform the data into an image, um, on, on existing compute power, in some cases, tomograms that you could collect in an hour or two would take literally tens of days to transform the data. One of the things we would like to move to is ensuring that when the user comes, they can actually visualize, they can see their data in near real time. You know, so the days when you came along and you measured your sample, and then a month or so later when you data reduced it, you think, oh, damn, I wish I'd done that measurement at the time. What we'd like to ensure is that users um, can actually see and understand what they're measuring very quickly so that they can, inf they can make an informed decision about the next thing to measure in, in their experiment. So a massive part of this as well is to ensure that we also provide the complementary compute power to do the data reduction. And that's not just you know, that's not just the hardware, it's also making sure that the algorithms are developed and brought up to speed as well. And on the left-hand side, uh, uh, and this is, this is already way out of date, you know, the growth of production and storage of data is now approaching the level of high energy physics. So when people about CERN, talk about CERN and the astronomy experiments, having vast quantities of data, actually synchrotrons are starting to approach that. And there's a real challenge here about how in the future we're gonna, we're gonna store all the data, and the answer is probably in the future, we won't store all the data because at the moment we don't have a sustainable solution. So there's some real 
thinking that these be put into um, what what we keep. Um, do we keep raw data? Do we um, only keep data that's been uh, reduced to some extent? These are all discussions still to be had. And then finally, of course, uh, I think we're all very aware of the rising cost financially and to the planet of energy. Um, uh, and one of the things we're doing um, is also making sure that as far as possible, um, uh, we, we, um, we mitigate the, the, the cost and energy of, of running diamond by, among other things, uh, having renewable uh, uh, um, uh, 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 forms of energy such as solar panels on, on the roof. And that's work that's uh, undergoing, uh, undergoing already. So what will it give us? Um, I, I'm going to focus last two slides, uh, two, two general things, and then last two slides on more catalytic things. So in very general terms, of course, um, a huge increase in speed, which will roughly translate as being able to look at structure through the fraction at least 10 times faster. Actually, the limiting thing will probably be just changing the sample, to be honest. Um, uh, being able to image um, not just um, uh, within cells, but actually scale up now to look at uh, organs um, from you know from the size of an organ down to uh, down to um, down to tens of nanometers and so forth. Entering into the field of new fields, fields that have names I hadn't heard of before, like uh, connect connectomics, the way in which you know uh, the the neural networks are, are connected in the brain and so forth. And there's some lovely work just coming out of ESRF now, imaging whole organs now and getting insights uh, into 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 how neural networks. Uh, our setup and work. And then, of course, um, being able to go to much higher energies and having that extra um, flux and brightness at high energies mean that we can look deeper inside materials faster. And this is something that really lends itself to material science, understanding devices and process and, and, and catalysis. Um, so just, just to flag two beam lines, and I can see the Sophia at the back, so she'll correct me if I get some of this wrong, and she can answer all your technical questions. There are two particular beam lines, I think, are very um, well suited to the catalysis community. They're both in the in the area of um, spectroscopy. Many of you have been part of this and already know about these things, but for those of you who don't, the first one is, is, is SWIFT, um, which is essentially a, a very rapid um, uh, scanning X-ray absorption spectrometer with two end stations. Um, uh, one focuses on the, the ultra fast, so it should be able to produce um, spectra at about 50 spectra a second which will allow, of course, uh, you to be able to look at processes in much more realistic, interesting timescales. A couple of examples here, fluidic devices for processing and, and, and rapid changes in catalyst structure. And of course, um, it's also often critical to understand um, the nature of catalysts in very specific regions of, uh, of a device or a system. So the other end station focuses on um, being able to look at, not as quickly, but look at much smaller areas, so down to 20 micron um, beam size, allowing um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy mapping on heterogeneous samples. And then the other, oh, sorry, it's got cut off a little bit. I'm sorry about that. Uh, the other um, beam line that's in our, in our, in our um, next phase of beam line development on Diamond 2 is Berries, um, Bright Environment for X-ray. You had fun thinking up this name. Uh, rather than resonant inelastic emission spectroscopies, again, essentially two end stations here. Um, um, uh, but the, the philosophy here really is to use harder X-rays to enable uh, users to look at, among other things, um, lighter atoms or um, focusing on particular atoms, the lighter atoms around that particular atom. So, um, and these are both, these, these, the two techniques are um, X-ray emission spectroscopy an X-ray Raman spectroscopy. They're both very um, photon hungry techniques. So they're only feasible when you have a, a lot of brightness, um, which is exactly what Diamond 2 um, will provide. So for the first time, we'll be able to provide X-ray Raman spectroscopy, which will allow direct insights now into relatively light atoms, um, something that harder X-ray techniques are not good at, but relatively lighter atoms, but then in an in-situ environment because you're using harder x-rays to do that. Uh, nice example here, uh, recent measurements looking at um, a, a palladium containing um, nitride catalyst for uh, ammonia oxidation. You can get a lot of information, of course, around the palladium with Zanes, but uh, currently uh, it's, it's, it, one can't use these techniques to look at the lighter atoms. And these harder x-ray techniques to look at lighter atoms will allow, for example, the structure of the nitrogen lattice to be elucidated. And then on the XES, 
a, a, a technique again, which because it's based on hard x -ray, hard x rays, allows you to look deep inside devices. Again, a, a nice example here. I think this was done on I twenty, but could only be done very slowly because it's very flux hungry. Starting to get insights in the environment of copper um, uh, in, in in a zeolite, but to be able to pick out. Um, what the copper is bound to in an intermediate is it bound to an oxygen, a carbon, or a nitrogen is extremely challenging with, with current softer X-ray techniques. And this will greatly accelerate um, the rate with which one can perform these measurements. And then finally, those heroic experiments, the pioneering experiments that have been done um, largely with scientists working through the research complex in the, in the catalysis hub, um, they will actually then become experiments that become, well, if not routine, I don't like to use the word routine because it makes it seem that it's ordinary and not special. These will all be exceptional experiments. Uh, but these sort of the multimodal um, uh, measurement uh, I mentioned a few slides ago, um, uh, um, will, will, you know, these are things which we'll be able to accelerate by at least a factor of 20. Um, and then it will also open up techniques that are starting to come through at the ESRF, so sort of called five dimensional operando chemical imaging, where the three of the dimensions are X, Y, Z in a particle. A fourth dimension is time, looking at the evolution of that in operando. And then the fifth dimension is for each of those X, Y, Z elements as a function of time, what is the chemical structure through a diffraction measurement? So this will open the door to this real sort of evolution of structure um, distribution within a, a, a particle or a series of particles in effectively the sort of timescales that might be interesting and useful to, to um, you who, whose primary interest is, interest is in, in catalysis. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, uh, I'm very happy to answer questions. Um, and I, th I think probably the key message is yes, there's a, a massive amount of this. It is around brilliant sources and it is around the next generation of instrumentation of data analysis. But a key enabling part of that is also to ensure that um, we work very closely with the appropriate communities, who ultimately are the people who are going to actually bring the science to the beam lines, who are going to think of the ways in which, you know, you've got a catalytic problem, how do you get your catalytic system in the beam line? And that's actually a lot of the time the toughest bit. And that only comes out of real close partnerships with, with the appropriate community. I think, and here the Catalyst Hub has been a fantastic success. You set out to do what you did at the outset. I know a number of people are a little bit. Um, I won't say skeptical, but we're waiting to see that the collaborations really happened. And this is the proof that they really happened. So we've really enjoyed working with you. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. That was a fascinating and I suspect unique perspective on the sort of development of diamonds. So any questions? Oh, yeah. I have one from online. Yes. Um, Beth Hill is asking if um, the X rays Raman spectroscopy that you mentioned is that available now? No. I don't think. In, in no, no, no. It, it's, it's off scale in terms of what we can do. We really need Diamond 2 for this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was, I was, I was going to say, I, I knew the answer anyway, Sophia, but you, your shake of your head just underlined that. <laughs> yeah. And there was a hand that went up here. Yeah. Oh, hello. <laughs> another, another Edinburgh chemist. Which means, can we, <laughs> My can goodness. Use the, uh, let's use the microphone so the online. There are a lot of Edinburgh chemists in here. <laughs> The name for that. Um, you talked a bit about um, harder X rays and penetration. Uh, can you say a bit about what that means in terms of beam damage for science? I think, it, again, Sophia, you're probably the better one on this. Um, in, in, in hard materials, um, it's probably not a great problem. In soft materials, it, 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 it is. So if you look at the biological samples, then after a certain period of time, you, you destroy them. Actually, however, perhaps counterintuitively, the the higher the energy of the X-ray, the longer, actually, the lower damage per photon per second there is. So harder X-rays are actually certainly less damaging of softer tissue. And I'm pretty sure that's also the case in harder, harder materials as well. So they're actually less damaging. But, but ultimately, if you expose the sample, soft sample long enough, you will, you will damage it. Yeah. That's
Oh, does that answer a question? Right? Stuart is uh, not an Edinburgh chemist, but he, yeah. he's allowed to ask a question. He's allowed. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned uh, inelastic scattering, topic near to my heart. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, to be able to do inelastic scattering, you need tremendous energy resolution. To be able to do vibrational, uh, yeah. you need instead of your one in ten to the five, you need what one in ten to the eight or something like that resolution. Are there well, any plans to, uh, to do to include that in the next generation? So you can get down to about 10 millivolts in, in EV terms with, 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 with we look at the energy coming in um, mm -hmm. typically on the on the Rick's experiment you, you, you can get down to about 10 millivolts which I know in neutron terms is pathetic <laughs> but actually it's getting you know someone said where, where do you think it's going to go I think getting towards one millivolt is 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 conceivable but there will be a you know orders of magnitude below that that will still be the domain of inelastic neutron scattering uh, there are there are exotic, really exotic X-ray techniques, most bar related techniques, which are also very high resolution, but they're very exotic techniques. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Matt. Maybe the last question. Did he actually have his hand up? Yes, he did. He well, he did. Went he went volunteering. He did. He did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Matt. You asked the question. <laughs> What's the capital? No, I'm not really sure. I've not been to Edinburgh ages, Andrew, but it's a fantastic talk. Really fascinating to see what's going on that I didn't know about. Um, a slightly more philosophical question, I guess. Um, what's the balance between the automation of everything and the digitization and the sort of physical growth of, of the canvas around Harwell? Um, because you know, both seem to be happening. What was the future? We're all going to sit at home in a darkened room and do things. Remotely. Yeah, that's a real. It's a really interesting. I mean, you know, um, I, I've got a personal view on it, and I actually think it's it's probably from the people I've talked to, it's the majority view. First of all, there is a balance to be reached. So yes, we were able to do a lot of what we were able to do because we were very um, automated, oh. but that really only suits repetitive measurements. Um, where you need to set up bespoke measurements. Um, we were able to do some of that, but it was really, you know, our beamline scientists were working with people remotely who were talking them through it. But that was, first of all, it was, it was far harder, but it was far less rewarding than having real people coming and working. Um, and I, you know, personally, I think science is also a very social activity and we were all surprised at how well Zoom and Teams and everything worked, but I was one of the people who, when people started coming back, it was great. <laughs> you know? So that tells me that there's, there's, you miss something by, by the remoteness. Um, and I think there's also a real worry here. One of the things we're seeing, for example, in structural biology, is university departments um, teaching crystallography less and less because one attitude is, those guys in Diamond will do it for us, or those people in Diamond will do it for us. Um, and I think that's a dangerous position to get into because I think if you start to disconnect the user community from the facility, um, and, and we're regarded, you know, just send things over to Diamond, DHL, the samples and so forth, um, I, I think that's really actually quite corrosive. So even though we can do a lot of those things remotely, I think even some of the things that lend themselves to remote access require real effort to be made to maintain the, the human contact. So, so for me, it's actually really critical. And, and, the, and the thing you know, about the campus is one of the key things is you meet people in the canteen and you talk randomly. It's the random interactions that you can schedule your Zoom meeting, you, but there's an awful lot of stuff that happens. I know it sounds very, a bit vague really, but it, you, know, you look at the history of science, a lot of stuff happens where people with different perspectives and ideas meet randomly. Um, so for me, actually, that's a really important thing to, to keep Good, I agree. It's that <laughs> okay. co-location and serendipity, which is probably yeah. a good segue into having a drink. Yeah, yeah. one more question. <laughs> well, so really just a follow-up from, from what you've been saying. I think it's really important to keep the community as well. Yeah. One of the great things that um, facilities do is they build up a community. And if, you know, everyone's working off just sending in samples, that's yeah. not going to... doesn't happen. work, no. And, and all the catalytic stuff here, 
worked because real people collaborated. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good. I think we're all on the same page. <laughs> Well, I know it's an ongoing discussion, but scientists try to keep all the data they uh. gather. So what are the ongoing argument, not the final one, that you will bring to a scientist to say, this data will come with you and this data you have to delete? Well, there are several answers. That. First of all, the data are getting to such large volumes in many areas, individual scientists can't really take them away anymore you know the, the days when you took your stuff home on a floppy disk and then a that, that those those are st those are ending in many areas in tomography it would be utterly nuts to try and take your data home with you you really need to put it on a, a <laughs> somewhere where you can actually crunch through it there may be areas where you can take your data away but but i would also say even if technically you could do it beyond safeguarding stuff that you know i mean you know if you're a phd student You've got to make sure that you get your stuff published before someone else does it and you get zumped, gazumped. But apart from safeguarding, uh, you know, competitive science at that level, I think it's really important you share stuff. And COVID-19 was a good example of that. Um, we had open publications. We had sharing of data almost immediately and everyone gained from it. So, so I think if there's one example that demonstrates the benefit of sharing results and data really quickly. It's the amazing progress we made in, in, in structural biology in, in COVID-19. Um, and I also think that, um, yeah, I, I think here the structural biologists have, have led the way. It's also the case that you have to deposit all your data when you take, you know, you have to make it freely available. You don't publish unless you've got published your data. And I think that's really healthy. Um, uh, because at the end of the day, I actually, you know, yes, a person has worked on, I, you know, I used to make samples, I used to sweat blood making samples, I know what it's like, but at the end of the day, I think the sooner you release that information into the wild, the better it is. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 you know, and when it comes to open data, the, the, there is no turning back on this, I don't think. D data is only going to become more open. It will become just part of the deal of taking, taking, taking data in the first place. With, with the suitable safeguards. Announcements, but let's thank Andrew once again for his outstanding. Okay.